Well, welcome everybody. We're so glad that you're joining us for the Lower School Town Hall for Parents. And this is Jill Webb, head, head of the Lower School. And I am joined this evening by Shelly Brown, who's Director of Early Childhood and also Assistant Head of Lower School, who's going to share a little bit tonight as well. And then Danielle Turkovich, who is our Director of Marketing and Communications. She is going to monitor the chat and facilitate uh, a Q&A at the end of this session. And I'm going to uh, share my screen with you and see if we can, oops. All right, can you all see that? We good? All right. Um, so this is a broad overview of the plan to come back to school in lower school. And I'm hopeful that you had a chance to hear Jeff Turwin's session last week that went into all of the, the details um, around quarantine and when you can come back to school or when you have to be out of school. That's all also offered in a document, but you may access his recorded session in the last email that you got from me on Friday. And this is really meant just to pick up kind of where we left off in that session and walk you through the translation of the school protocol and see what it will look like just in lower school. And for our purposes in this conversation, um, we will be talking mainly about grades one through four. And in some cases, it will intersect with kindergarten a little bit, but mostly it will be in grades one through four. So everything we've done and everything we've planned and everything that we have considered obviously is driven by a shared commitment to health, safety, and well-being. And that is for your children who we know are precious to you, but also um, to your whole family and all of our teachers who will be coming back into the building. So that is where everything comes from and every decision is built on that foundation. So a little bit about the, um, the lower school protocol for masks and the whole school masks are required by all faculty and staff in every grade and that is from little jags all the way up through grade 12. Um, we do know in, in consultation with local pediatricians and Franklin County Health Organization, as well as other um, folks who are serving as resources to us, that children do need to have time during the day where they can take their masks off. And so we've been uh, in just uh, continuing conversation about um, our commitment to offer children a chance to take their masks off, but also making sure that we're safe in the way we do that. So um, it seems clear that we will take masks off during lunch and during snacks, and children will be in assigned seats in their assigned spots, um, very distanced in the classroom when they're eating lunch or snack, and they will, of course, have their masks off during that time of day. And then we're looking to fold in um, each hour to have a mask break. And we will try to do those outside anytime we can, weather permitting. Um, when we are in bad weather and we can't go outside, the mask breaks will have to be when students are distanced so they're at least six feet apart, they are seated, and they are quiet. So it might be when they are doing uh, silent reading or they're doing writing. It would not be when they're in conversation or dialogue or in small groups or working on a project with someone else. Um, we have determined, uh, at least at this point, that it is safest for students to wear masks when they're on brain break. And that's a time where we want them to get outside and move, but it's very difficult for us to control who might run past someone else. And so just to be um, very cautious, at this point, we're going to have everyone wear masks during brain break and that we will see how what the temperature's like and we'll learn a little bit um, from those initial practice days that we'll have kids come on their two visit days 
um, whether we need to build in time after brain break for students to take off their masks, spread out outside before they go back into the building so they can breathe freely and cool down a little bit before they come back in. Um, we are looking at lanyards for masks. Um, we haven't ordered them yet, but we probably will be. Um, we have a requirement that they be breakaway or tearaway lanyards so that, you know, no lanyard can get caught on any piece of equipment um, where it might choke a child. So these would be lanyards that would pull apart um, if it got caught on anything. So um, we'll let you know when those have been purchased. Um, we want everyone to have a water bottle. We are not using drinking fountains, um, but they, they are refillable stations so they can uh, fill their own water bottles. We are going to ask that they take those home every night and you wash them thoroughly and send back a clean one the next day. We're asking for beach towels as well. It doesn't have to be a beach towel. It can be a bath towel, but with your child's name on it. And we're gonna use those when we go outside. So it's something to sit on if we are out under the tents that we have ordered. Um, and if the weather is nice, we, we may be having snack or lunch outside as well. So a beach towel would be a great place to sit. We're going to ask everyone to bring two masks and um, you will be hearing from the school on what the official guidelines are for what masks you can bring. And so that they're all um, aligned with our safety protocol and um, we want two clean masks every day. So if your child um, uses just one mask during the day, then we would want um, your child to bring that home, get it washed and bring it back. If your child uses two masks a day, bring them both home, wash them, bring them back. And they should be washed uh, every, every day after school. And we have an uh, almost a limitless number of extra masks that are available. So if your child, for whatever reason, would go through two masks, um, we have plenty to share. So we had some questions about the dress code. The dress code is going to stay the same. So we are coming to school and we want children to feel like they're at school and also feel like school has some aspects that feel a little bit normal. Um, if if you are on campus, of course, you will wear the typical dress code and um, we'll be sending those out to you and those can also be found on Veracross. The one change we're making is you, no child has to wear a belt. That's one more thing that they have to touch and, and sort of deal with. So that'll make everybody happy, no belts. Um, we're also asking if you are learning from home, we're asking that you also abide by the dress code. We want the children at home to feel in every way like they are part of the classroom. And we want them to show up for the day ready, like they are going to school, they are not eating breakfast while we're um, meeting with them virtually. They're not in their pajamas, they're not in their bed, they're not wrapped in a blanket. We want them ready for school. So a good way to do that would be to have them um, dressed also according to our dress code. So we are just starting to get our lower school classrooms ready. And um, this is a third grade classroom. This is uh, Mrs. Smith, Ms. Sheridan. And um, this will give you a sense of how far apart the tables and the desks are. This room is just starting to come together. We're, um, as I think I mentioned earlier that we've bought some new furniture and it's not all there yet. So we're just trying to get the things we have uh, arranged in a way that is safe. And we have uh, classes all over the building. So this one is going to be a third grade class that is moving into the science room. So we've got the science tables all spread out and that room is just waiting for chairs. And you can see on the table in the front um, are supply boxes. And I'll show you what those look like in just a minute. Um, we'll also have a class in the library. And here's Miss Johnson in her class. She has desks instead of tables. And there she is waving a hello to everybody, um, anxious for them to come back to school. She's also wearing her mask. So each child will have dedicated supplies and we have a box that looks like this for every single student in lower school. 
And um, these are the supplies that we have purchased for students in grades one through four. Um, there are more supplies coming if you are learning from home. So these are just kind of the basic supplies that you would need for most any activity. Um, but we have um, a number of science supplies that will be added and art supplies if you are learning from home. So uh, Mrs. Steger has been getting those um, kits all together so that uh, if you are doing experiments at home instead of on campus, you can do them right along with the students who are here at school. So those will be available. Um, we will do those a month at a time. So you will get the supplies for two special areas each month. So that would mean um, a quick drive through and we would hand you a bag of the new supplies and then you would drive off. So um, your child can participate actively, whether they're on campus or learning from home. So lunch, a lot of questions about, can we pack lunch? Do we have to have school lunch? Um, there is the option to bring your own lunch. And what we ask is that you make a four week commitment. So if you're going to pack your lunch, we are gonna ask you to pack it for the full four weeks. And if you're going to take advantage of our delicious school lunch, that you would also do that for four weeks. And there will be a way to identify your preference through Veracross. And um, they have made a decision to repeat the first month's menu exactly the same as the second month so that children will get used to what food options are there and will know whether that's a good option for them. So you'll see um, in October, it'll be the same menu as September, and then you'll see much more variety as the year unfolds. Um, our dining room and our um, dining room staff are committed to honoring anyone who has any kind of allergies or sensitivities to food. If you have any food restrictions, we will honor those the same way we would if you were eating in the dining room. That would include vegetarian options. If you are going to pack your lunch, um, we're going to ask you to please commit to a healthy lunch and a healthy snack that um, are in alignment with our healthy snack guidelines. And um, basically we avoid the, the, the C's, which we say uh, cookies, cakes, and candy. And if you can stay away from what we would consider processed snack food, we find that the students are much more able to learn and be alert in the afternoon if they've had a really healthy, nutritious lunch. Um, most of our classes will be eating uh, in their own classrooms or outside when the weather is nice. Um, each grade level will have a one week rotation through the dining room and then we will repeat. So we haven't decided which grade level will go first, but if for instance, it was fourth grade, they would be distanced in the dining room and the Dorschlag den will be spread all over and there will be teachers in there with them as well and they would have the same lunch as the students who are eating in the classroom. Um, even if they're in the dining room, we will not have any kind of self-serve food like the salad bar, or the deli bar, or anything like that. Their food would be coming in closed containers that um, are identical to what would come to the classrooms. They would eat what they would like to eat and it's a, it's a, has wide variety and it's sort of delicious and balanced. And when they're finished, they will just close that box and we will give them back to the dining room staff. There won't be any clearing of um, dishes or plates or those boxes that'll all be done by the adults who work um, in our food service. So special areas. Um, there are, I know a lot of schools that are coming back to school who have not found a way to include special areas. And thanks to Deborah Parks, who has worked tirelessly on probably 150 versions of our schedule. I am not exaggerating, there have been many. Um, we have found a way to include our special areas in um, both learning from home and on campus. And the way we're going to do that is to assign a special area teacher to each grade level cohort. 
So if you are in second grade, you might have Gina Spicer, our art teacher, would come and be a part of the second grade cohort for two solid weeks. And she would teach art every single day for those two weeks to those grade levels. And she would not be mixing with other grade levels or other cohorts. Now, when she is teaching live with second grade, we would ask that if you're learning from home, you have your brain break then and you take a break. And then in the afternoon, when um, the students on campus are taking a brain break, then that teacher will work just with you. So if you're learning from home, you will have um, a special session with each special area teacher that's dedicated just to you. And all of the special areas will rotate every two weeks. So every two weeks, you will have 10 days in a row with a new special area, whether you are at home or um, working at school. Um, physical education, a lot of questions around that. And that's something where we have been consulting with the experts and continue to do that. All of the um, guidance that we've received says that it really is safe if we keep kids far apart and they're outside, that uh, PE is perfectly safe. And um, we're going to be overly cautious at the beginning, but I think we will be able um, to move to having kids maybe have some, some mask breaks when they're in PE. So lower school PE will probably most of the time be on Roberts Field. That's the big soccer field in the front of the school. And so they can spread way out. And when they are not on Roberts Field, they will have in their cohorts, and these are small groups, so it may be 11 or 12, maybe 13 students at one time, you know, on the field or in the gym, there is plenty of room for them to distance far beyond six feet. Um, and when PE is um, with the cohort, they will be available to help with structured play when that group goes outside and give them some interesting and fun things to do that are also mindful of safety. So here are some examples that Mrs. Fuller has provided in the kinds of equipment or activities that we may um, try to fold in after we've had um, some experience with being back on campus. All of the equipment would be designated to one student. So um, over on the left, you can see that there's a hula hoop. The student would be standing in the hula hoop and um, they can use the bowling ball. These aren't real bowling balls, um, they're light. <laughs> um, and they can roll across the field and knock the pins down. They're the only ones touching the pins, they're the only ones touching the ball, and they are staying right in their space. And maybe you know, 12 feet away or more would be another student doing something similar. The one on the right is a similar activity where you would stand on the disc. And um, this is a fishing activity because that's a lifelong activity that we have as part of our physical education program. And um, they've got a little bobber on the end and they're trying to cast into the hula hoop at the end there. We're not going to start with these right at the beginning of the year, even though we have been assured that they're more than safe. Um, we're just going to work towards that at some point. And when we do, these are the kinds of activities that students would be doing in lower school PE. When the class would be over, the teacher would, she herself, would disinfect all of the materials that have been used before they go back into storage. So parent communication um, is, you. yes. So it's Danny. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I just sure. kind of have a, a point of clarification before we move into the next chapter. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So we're getting a lot of questions about a point that was made earlier in the slide about lunch. Um, it said pay in Veracross, and I think what we meant was you'll just need to opt in oh. or opt out in Veracross. Oh. 
I'm sorry, it should say, it should just said say in Veracross, not pay. Yeah, so, sorry. Just, no, no worries. So just to clarify for, for the audience that we will not be charging additional <laughs> dollars for lunch. And due to all of the model changes that we have made, you know, there really, <laughs> there is a lot of staffing and process that goes behind that, but that will not affect your tuition payments. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was clear and not concerned about that. Um, you will have the opportunity to opt in and out of that in Veracross, like Joe was saying, every four weeks, and it'll probably open up every like, you know, mid month, maybe the 15th of each month, you'll have that option to go back in and change your preferences there. So that's all I had. I'll, I'll let you get back to the presentation. Thank you so much. Like, no, we're not charging for lunch. And so I'm glad you jumped in and my apologies for not catching that. Um, Yes, and as far as I know right now, it is going to be around the 15th of the month. It'll be the middle of the month where you will declare your preference um, for the next month. Um, parent communication is going to shift a little bit and we're gonna talk about the uh, platforms for technology in just a moment. Um, but we're going back to something that we had some years ago and that is what we used to call affectionately the Friday letter. And so each week you will get an email from your child's instructional group leader, teacher, um, who will give you a summary of what happened that week and a brief preview of what will happen in the coming week. And that will where, be where all announcements and um, reminders or any information that's just a discrete statement will all be in those emails. So they will be um, relatively short, but I think since you can't come in the building and see all the wonderful displays on the boards and um, see the work that the children are doing, um, we'll be using uh, Seesaw and Google Classroom to share some of that with you, but we're also going to go back to once a week sending you an email from the teacher letting you know what was covered in that week and what's coming. So there, um, there's a new form of technology and these are just a few of the monitors with the iPads attached that are getting ready to roll into our instructional spaces. And this is the new technology that will assist us in having a live connection with students who are learning from home. And these are on wheels so that we can wheel you around if you're in a small group and you're in a discussion, we can just have you up on the screen and the children in the group can talk to your child and your child can talk back to them in, in real time. So you will see um, some training in that coming for all of us and for you. All right, so Seesaw you're uh, familiar with and I'm gonna turn things over to Shelly for just a minute and talk just a little bit about how Seesaw is going to complement um, our other platform for technology. Thanks, Jill. For Seesaw, it'll be a two-way street. Um, it is one way that students will share their work with parents. So if the student is in the classroom, some of the teachers will utilize the Seesaw tool for them to share their work with the parents at home and that you would have a login where you could check your child's kind of online journal. And Seesaw is an app that we utilize on the iPads and it's also, you can utilize it in a web browser. If you're learning from home, it's one way that your teacher might request you to share your work back to the teacher. Um, especially in first grade, we'll be using Seesaw a lot for that. Um, if the child is accessing their work in the Google Classroom, which we'll show you in a moment, they might be sending their work back to the teacher and the teacher is able to see their work through the Seesaw app. Great. And then the next one is Google Classroom. Yes, and so um, our, we're not going to be using Veracross in the way we did in the spring. Um, as a school, we are shifting to Google Classroom, and I'm going to stop sharing so that Danny can do that, and then we're going to walk you through what the Google Classroom looks like, and I'm also going to let you know that um, 
we're going to be training students right at the beginning of the year in how to use that. And um, we also will offer some trainings for parents as well so that you'll have ease in accessing the information that you need. Great, so Danny is sharing her screen right now and this would be the kind of landing page for the Google Classroom. Every student will have access to the Google Classroom and this is where their assignments live. So this is really the classroom as we think about it. It has the assignments, the schedule, the Zoom links, and this is a one-stop shop for our students. When you first go, um, Danny, sorry, can you go back to the stream, please? Um, the stream will be where the schedule lives each week, and so it will be labeled for that week. And when Danny clicks on the schedule, every classroom will have their schedule here. And this is just a mock schedule. Um, but we're using icons and colors and some bitmojis for the students, especially for our youngest students, just really easy to read those icons versus reading text. And you'll see along the left hand side, again, a mock schedule We have a morning meeting at 8 a.m. with a Zoom. And then the teacher's bitmoji would be there and the student would be able to click that bitmoji on Monday and it would take them right to the Zoom link that they need to be in. And then if they go down to art, you can see it's a Zoom call and they would click that and it would take them right to the art Zoom with Mr. Spicer. Along the top, you can see the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we've used a color coding system that we'll introduce to our students and even our three-year-olds will learn these color coded system. Um, and you'll see that come into play in just one moment. But on Monday, we can see a red dot. And when we scroll a little bit further down, we can see there's a writing activity on Monday as well. So when Danny clicks into her coursework, which is towards the top, You are in the right spot, Danny. It says classwork, there you go. Classwork, sorry, there we go. Um, you can see that same week, and now I can see that red dot in that pencil, and as a student, I'll start to know that that red dot means that's a Monday writing activity, and there's my assignment. And if I go down, I'll see an orange dot with a globe, and that's a Tuesday social studies activity. And when I click it, it will tell me as a student what I need to do to finish that task. We'll be using this for the students who are learning from home, but as Jill mentioned, we'll also be using it from the first day of students in the classroom as well. So some of their activities they'll be completing using Google Docs or a Flipgrid, or they might be watching a recorded video that their teacher has recorded that they can then respond to. So they'll be really familiar with the Google Classroom, whether they're in the classroom or learning from home. Great, do you wanna say about Clever as well? Clever is a one-stop shop for sign-ins, and we realized in the spring, um, we were really fortunate with many apps and many pieces like Seesaw, but they require different logins, and that can be challenging as a student, even as a fourth grader, to manage the logins. So Clever will be almost a backpack of apps and tools that the student will utilize. They sign in one time with a simple sign-in, and then that gives us them access to everything that's in their Clever backpack. And Seesaw will live in their Clever backpack. So they sign in once, and then they have access to all the apps that we've assigned them to along with Seesaw. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so Danny, I saw some of the questions in the chat. Would you like to bring some of those forward? Absolutely, so I think the first thing that I would just like to cover is really around you know, supplies and what the, the student learning from home experience might look like, how it may differ. So can you talk a little bit more about that, please? Yes, um, the supplies that will go home for students who are learning from home, um, we'll update, update those about once a month. And so um, depending on which special area you have, you'll have two of them in that month period they will be sending materials home for you to use so that you can participate right along with everyone else. So at this point, we were anticipating that would be just once a month that you would drive through and we would hand you the supplies and you would be off. Um, learning from home and um, the, the individual teachers will be working with you on the specific schedule for the grade level. 
And so that will differ a bit from first grade to fourth grade. Um, but there will be times where um, students are learning with a recorded session so that they can, and that's true of on campus as well, so that they can go at their own pace. They can rewind, watch it again, stop, ask a question. Um, and then the activity and the processing and the application of that would be done live in conversation and um, in discussion. So you will see all of those. You will have the opportunity if you are learning from home to watch live if a teacher is doing a presentation and you can raise your hand and say, excuse me, I've got a question when you said that and the teacher can respond to you right then in real time. Um, but there will also be opportunities for you to access recorded sessions and then um, there will be live connections with the teacher to complement those. So you can also say, I watched the video, I've got some questions. And, and so there'll be much more opportunity for two-way conversation that isn't just um, written communication. Seesaw is helpful for that because that has a nice a voice recording um, application that, and that's why we're using that along with Google Classroom. But with the new technology, um, we're anticipating that we'll have much more two-way conversation. I will say we've had some practice with that. It's not the same technology. Ours was a little awkward because it was um, some time ago, but we've had a couple occasions where some students have had to learn from home for an extended period of time. And we actually just had an iPad on a cart and we would just sort of push them around to whatever class they were going to. And we found that to be um, as close as we could possibly get to having them with us in the class so that we could ask them a question they could ask back and um, engage in conversation with their peers. Thank you so much for explaining that a little bit further. The next question really kind of dovetails with that. When we're thinking about the beginning of the year prior to our first academic day, so our reorient, reorientation <laughs> schedule. Can yeah. you please unpack that a little bit more for us in terms of on-campus activities and then what um, opportunities to connect might be available for people that choose to learn from home? Yes, yeah. so any orientation that we're offering for students that is related to academics, we will connect with students from home. If our orientation is dedicated to learning how to use the restroom or how to wash hands, um, obviously, we won't be connecting with you for those activities. Um, but anything that has to do with the introduction to technology, um, how we are going to build community, um, we will have some morning meetings and closing circles and getting to know each other activities, and those will all include the students from home. Awesome, thank you so much. And before I volley another question to you, we just had one question come in that I think is super interesting, which was around the percentage of families that have completed the survey for you know whether or not they are thinking they're gonna come in and how confident they're feeling. And we've actually had a really great response. So thank you to everybody on this call that has opted to share your feedback with us first. Um, and the second thing I'll say is that we've had about a 60, percent um, of our respondents have said they do plan to be on campus at least for the first four weeks. Um, and so they're feeling pretty confident about that. And then we have another um, group of people who just haven't made a decision yet. And then um, about another 20% who have decided for their family that it's best to start out learning from home. So that is that piece of information. And I will just say like, we will continue to staff accordingly. And Jill, maybe you can talk a little bit about more about teacher ratios and how we will ensure safety given that, you know, kids can opt in and out um, and what might happen if we do have an influx of uh, students. Well, there's a limit um, in every space by how far we can distance. So the number of students really is driven by how big the space is. Obviously, you can distance more children in the gym um, than you can in a breakout room. And so every single classroom has a capacity and um, doesn't matter if you are on campus or learning from home, we, we have capacity. And when you are assigned to that 
instructional group, um, you are uh, a part of that capacity, whether you are learning from home or at school. So if students opt out of being on campus or other students come back in, we will never go over that capacity. Awesome, thank you. So to go back a little bit to the reorientation days, can you talk about whether or not there may be options for students who choose to learn from home for the initial period to actually spend some time on campus or is it a, a clean opt-in versus learn from home approach? If you, you and your um, child decide that they would like to come in those small groups, we would love to have them. The chance to connect in real time and in life before they um, go back home to learn from home. Again, since they are included in the count for that instructional group, yes, you can come for those two days and we would, we would welcome them and be happy to have them. So those groups will be, you know, it's, it's hard to say numbers because we don't know exactly how many people have, will commit to being on campus, but um, it'll be about half of the group will be there um, for the first two days and half for the other two days. So those groups, you know, maybe um, five, six or seven students there for the whole day in, in a typical lower school classroom. So, you know, they'll be very spread out. And Jill, do you want to share a little bit about how intakes have changed, how the child will be included in the intakes? Yes, and we know that a lot of people won't have had the opportunity to be on campus because um, our back to school Sunday has changed to welcome to Wellington. And uh, we just don't want all those people together in the same place on campus. But we do want to um, have people feel and your student, your children in particular, feel comfortable at school. So intake conferences now can include your child. So um, you will sign up and we've got, um, we've got four days, five days um, of intake conferences and I sent those dates to you on Friday. And so we were spreading it out over a much longer period. We used to do them all in one day. So you've got plenty of time to come and we're going to uh, invite people by appointment to come and do your intake conference in the classroom with the teacher. And if you wanna bring your child, we, we invite you to do that. Um, if there's information you want to share with us that you might not want to share in front of your child, um, we'll have a form that you can fill out to get to us. Um, we're happy to connect and have a conversation um, outside of earshot of, of your child. But that way you can see the space and your child can see the space. And we know how important it is that um, if a child's coming to school, and that's why we've always had events where you get to come and see the classroom before school starts, and we won't be having parents walk students into the classroom, that would be a great opportunity to come see the space, meet the teacher. Um, if your child's feeling a little anxious about not knowing what their room will look like, they can come in and see that as well. The other option is if you don't feel comfortable being on campus, you will sign up through Veracross um, for either on campus or a virtual intake conference. And the virtual um, intake will be Zoom and you can do that just as adults or you can, you can include your child in that conversation as well. Every instructional group teacher will be sending a video to you on August 24th where um, your child will get to see who his or her teacher is and they'll be able to take their masks off so you can see their whole face and they're also going to walk you around the classroom um, with their ipads and show you what the room looks like so that will be yet another way for children to feel familiar with the space whether they're in the space or learning from home excellent thank you so much the next topic we've heard a lot about in the chat is around aftercare can you talk what, about what we know at this point about aftercare services this year? Right now, aftercare, um, and Shelly, we are limited to early childhood. Correct. At this point. And that's, is it up through kindergarten? 
kindergarten is included. Yeah, and um, there have been no formal decisions made about aftercare for grades one through four. And the big um, challenge there is not mixing cohorts. If we're keeping everyone separate during the day, um, we don't want to have them mix after school. So um, that is an ongoing conversation. And I know it is of great importance to a number of families. It is to us as well. So as soon as we have an update on that, um, you'll hear that day from the school. This is also another opportunity for me to kind of plug the all parent survey. I think the second question is specifically around aftercare. So if you have not had a chance to cast your vote and raise your hand and say, we really want it, um, please, <laughs> please make sure to do that through the survey or you can contact any of us directly just to, to share that because we certainly want to know and understand the, the, the full scope of our parent needs. Um, the next question that I have for you is around our favorite topic. Well, one of them anyway, masks. So <laughs> I think I was just saying yesterday, with all things 2020, things seem to be shifting constantly by the hour. Can you unpack more around what the mask guidelines are for our students at this point? in terms of what they can wear. Thank you, yes. We had some okay. questions about um, face shields, bandanas, all of that type of thing. Great, um, and you are gonna get a communication that um, addresses that as a whole school. Um, that will go into much more detail than I will now, but um, no, face shields, no, not unless they're worn with a mask. And I can tell you the teachers would be so happy to be able to wear a shield and no mask because they want the students to be able to see the faces of the teachers. Um, they just aren't safe enough because there's airflow. And we've looked at ones that go down and ones that go up, but none of them restrict the airflow in the way you need to in order to be safe. So um, no shields unless you wear a mask underneath it. And there will be some teachers in the school who will be wearing both. They will be wearing a mask and a shield um, just for extra protection. Um, no bandanas and no gaiters. And then we'll be sending guidelines on how thick your mask has to be. So we're gonna be really specific about what students can wear um, when they're at school. We did um, meet with early childhood parents last night and I will share this same bit of advice to lower school parents. Um, we don't know what you've been doing over the summer and maybe your children have been kind of in their own cohort and have been able to spend most of the time without a mask it would be really helpful if you have them start practicing wearing a mask before they come to school and just do a little bit each day and kind of extend that so that they don't go from never wearing one to wearing one all day. Um, we have found in a number of events that have happened outside of school as well as um, some of the childcare we offered this summer that students get used to wearing it and we know that they've done it in other countries before we have had to do that. So um, it's just a matter of knowing that it's required. It's not an option and everyone's doing it, the grownups and the children. But I think just giving them a little extra practice in just being grown up like that would uh, be a good thing to do before school starts. I will add one more thing when we talk about cohorts. I didn't mention uh, substitute teachers, and I don't know if anybody has asked a question about that. Um, we are not bringing outside people into the school. So even our speech screenings will be done virtually. So the person who provides that service for us will not be on campus. And um, all of our substitutes will be in-house people. So we are hiring instructional support staff who will become part of our school. We'll have people dedicated just to lower school. And when they are not needed as a sub, we'll just use them for extra classroom support or to help supervise out on the playground and so on. So we won't be having any outside substitutes uh, join us. Thank you, that's a great mm -hmm. detail to know. So just one, um, point I want to come back to that I saw early in the chat around transportation and busing. As 
most everybody knows by now, many of the public schools are not going back in terms of on campus. However, many of our students rely on their transportation services. So Jill, I'm happy to add what we know to date. And that is that despite the fact that school districts are not operating on campus, they will still be working with Wellington to provide safe, um, distanced, busing services within each school district that we already work with. So our chief operating officer is in direct contact with the schools and we hope to have more specific information around that piece in the coming days. So just wanted to share that before I move into the next big topic that we heard a lot about and that is around drop off, pick up, start stop. Um, first of all, can you talk and reiterate just a little bit more about what those times look like, uh, what the procedure is, and then what happens if a parent, you know, they get stuck in traffic or something suddenly comes up and they can't pick up their child by pickup time. Okay. Um, well, we are starting a little later and ending a little earlier. And the reason for that is that um, teachers are not going to have time during the day where they can actually be away from the students much um, because we have broken our larger classes down into such small groups that every adult is working with a group. And um, our teachers need time to record lessons. They need time to meet as a grade level team um, to ensure consistency across all of the instructional groups. And the only way we could do that was to give them some time in the morning and some time at the end of the day where they're not with children. And so that is why the hours are as they are. So um, we're not gonna let students in until 8.30 and then you will come in and uh, the students will come in and you will part with your child before they come into the school and they will go directly to their classroom. We will have adults all along the way to make sure that students are distanced as they make their way to their classes. And so classrooms open at 8.30 and um, you have between 8.30 and 8.45 and we start marking people tardy at 8.45 and the day will begin in earnest at 8.45. If you are running a little late and it's after 8.45, um, in the old system, we would have you report to the lower school office with your child. We're not going to have you do that. We're going to have you sign in in the rotunda, and then we will have somebody meet your child there and, and escort them to class so they don't have to do that on their own. So that'll all happen um, in the rotunda, not in the lower school office. Um, so we've got two major blocks in the schedule. We've got an uninterrupted literacy block and we've got an uninterrupted math block. And we pretty much built the day around those two because we know how important those are. And so those are about an hour each and a lot of different activities um, embedded in those blocks. It's not like they're gonna be sitting still for an hour. Um, there are lots of engaging activities for them to have. Um, but those will remain the same. And that's been a commitment um, in, in any circumstance in the lower schools that we protect those blocks. Um, lunch will be close to 11, um, between 11 and 1110 probably for lower school. Um, and then they will have the afternoon, which will, if, it, if they had literacy in the morning, they'll have math in the afternoon or vice versa. And then around three o'clock, um, we will be bringing students out to Carline and um, we're working out the specific details to that, but um, we are going to have marks on the sidewalk where they will stand so that they're all distanced all along the sidewalk so that we make sure everybody is six feet apart. And then we will um, still have your names on your visor like you had in other years for Carline. And then we will call your child and they will step off their dot and walk to your car. But we'll have a little more structure uh, at the end of the day just to make sure everyone stays distanced even though we are outside and um, it's a bit safer outside. When we have um, bad weather um, for rain, we used to put everyone in the rotunda and call them from the rotunda out to Carline 
and um, we're now developing uh, a whole system for different ways to get children from their classrooms out to Carline uh, if the weather is bad. And so we may be Zooming. Uh, the person who's calling cars might be on Zoom with all of the classrooms and um, the teachers can log in and that person can call the child and whichever classroom they're in, they will be dismissed and walk out and join you out in Carline. Um, we don't know how long it's going to take yet because uh, we haven't uh, had much practice with this. So those practice days where you come before September 8th will give us a sense of, you know, if, there, if there's anything we need to tweak that would make it more efficient or safer, um, quicker, that'll, that'll help us kind of know what we're, what we're managing. But um, that's what it'll look like. And it, the car line will be in the same place. You'll come in the driveway and come up and around and you'll meet your child on the sidewalk up near the building, although I suspect we'll be spread out a bit more. Thank you so much. And can you speak just briefly before we move on to a new topic about kids who have siblings in different divisions and given that the start and stop times are slightly staggered, where might those siblings kind of hang out or stay? What are the accommodations for those multi-divisional families? Um, well, we're working with middle school to sort of make that as small a gap as possible. But um, if it's a five minute gap, it may mean that your middle schooler gets out and walks in and that your lower schooler walks in four or five minutes later. Yeah, we will not have morning care for the same reason we're struggling with aftercare is that we don't want the cohorts to mix. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. So the next question I have is um, just a clarification for new families or families who may not be familiar with our technology stack. And so Shelly, you mentioned the Seesaw application. Can you unpack what Seesaw is and kind of paint a picture for us and how it works within the rest of our technology stack. Um, Seesaw is really viewed as that connection between home and school, and it becomes a digital portfolio that the child has. And so, as I mentioned, if you have a first grader and they're in the classroom and they've done something that they're really proud of, that they might take a photo of their work and then they're able to share that just with their caregiver. So it doesn't go out to the whole entire class, it goes to their caregiver and their caregiver can give a feedback on that. So it could just, if I was the mom, I might say, oh my gosh, I'm so proud of that. I love the way you wrote your name. Um, there is also a way for the teacher to take a photo of something that the entire class has done. If they've Zoomed with a firefighter and that was the highlight of the day, the teacher could take a photo of that and then send that to the entire class every parent would receive that notification and it might give some background or some context to that picture. As a family on your end, you have an app or it can be a login into a web browser and you can set the parameters around notifications. If you're someone who loves to get notified and you wanna get notified every time your child posts something, um, you can turn that on. For some children, that will be 25 times a day. Um, a lot of families prefer a once a week notification, so it just reminds them to check into that Seesaw account. And um, so that's something that you can set on your end so that you have that awareness of how often you wanna be notified. If your child was learning from home, um, we're flipping the model. And Seesaw was originally designed for the first way that I explained, for children to share their work with their family and to be an online portfolio. But they as a company have also flipped the model where you at home, if you've done something that you wanna share with your first grade teacher, then you can document it and send it to your teacher and then your teacher can give that feedback to you. So it becomes an avenue for feedback. And the really nice piece about it is for the younger students, you can use um, audio, you can use visual, visual, <laughs> visual uh, and the students can write right on the screen um, opposed to having to type. And so it's a really handy tool for our younger students, but even our older students will utilize it when needed. Yeah, so it, um, you know, there's, there are many um, valuable characteristics of Google Classroom and, and Seesaw also has its own unique um, benefits, but the two together we think uh, make the strongest approach so that we've got multiple avenues for communication and that they're both 
become much more streamlined than what we had in the spring. Wonderful. Thank you so much to both of you. I do have time for one more question. And then I do have a couple of announcements on behalf of the school that I'd love to share. The last question that I have in the chat that I think it would be really good to share out is around shared shared learning spaces like the Abbott Learning Center. Mm. How are we currently thinking about how we might give access to, to our readers uh, specifically with the Abbott Center? We're hearing a few times about that. I'm so glad somebody asked that question because we met on that today. Um, we're not going to have students in the learning center, but we are bringing books out to them. So if you've ever had experience with a bookmobile, um, we will have a bookmobile that will visit each classroom and that students will be filling out an inventory of the kinds of books they want or particular books they want and the librarians will deliver those right to the classroom to the students. If you are learning from home, the bookmobile is going to come to your house and um, you will have books that same way your child can identify topics or genre or um, just make suggestions and the librarians will pull books for you and bring those right to you. We have in-class libraries as well. And um, anybody who's uh, been a teacher knows that having books in the hands of children is of uh, a primary interest and commitment on the part of, of any school. And because of that, we've got um, a wide variety of books that are available in each classroom. And we asked for some guidance on um, what the protocol should be for students touching books. And that was something that we um, wanted to have clarification on. And so that was shared with faculty today. And um, the guidelines state that there's a 72 hour rest period from the time one student touches a book to the time the next student touches a book. So we'll have books in quarantine uh, for 72 hours so that um, they won't immediately go from one student to another. And that's one of, uh, again, one of the reasons we won't be in the learning center because we just want to make sure we know who has touched what, even though um, surface contact spread is not um, such a big concern as the airborne, we are going to be um, on the side of caution around that. So teachers will be by grade level, identifying the protocol for their grade. And it may be that they check out books on a certain day and they bring them all back on a different day. And so that we don't have a rolling 72 hour tracking that we've got to manage. But um, we want kids to have books and we want them to have a constant supply of books. So that is a safe way to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much. And with that, I think that kind of wraps our main presentation. And then I just had a few housekeeping notes and announcements to share with this group specifically based on what I saw in the chat. The first thing I wanted to mention was if your question that you submitted tonight didn't get answered or if you didn't hear what you were expecting to hear, please uh, hang tight. We are seeing each and every question in the chat and we're saving these chats and working on um, FAQs for each division, and you can look for those in the coming days. Um, I would also say that we'll be making this session recording available on YouTube, along with all of the other divisions, which we will also be hosting on YouTube. So we hosted the early childhood session last night, which Jill mentioned, and that will also be available. That contains all the information you'll need for little Jags, pre-K and kindergarten students. So you can look for that link to come in the coming days. I'll also say we will have more opportunities to engage, specifically at the grade level and, and you know, more, you know, in your small groups. So please look for additional information on that. And then version three, we plan to have that published by August 25th, and that will be final for opening. Again, with, with all things 2020, it is subject to change, but that will be our reopening plan for 2020. And that will be the final version prior to first day of academic classes will be released August 25th. And last and certainly not least, 
the burning question of how can we get some gear? <laughs> so there are a few ways that we will be making available uh, shopping opportunities. So the classic uniform sale is being reimagined and there will be opportunities for that in the coming days and weeks. Um, I'll just share that we will be having a kind of a sidewalk sale style this year. The first opportunity will be August 30th from 11 a.m. to 1 and then there will be subsequent dates after that. You can look for that information in your email in the coming days. The second was Sokol Store. So if you've ever been in the Sokol Store, you know how small it is. And add on top that we aren't allowing visitors at this point, it makes it kind of hard to shop the Sokol Store. So we are currently working to build a square site where you can peruse and purchase and we will, we are creating systems for getting that merchandise to you. So we'll have all of the usual t-shirts and gear. We're also working on producing some Wellington masks and all of the things that make Wellington swag great. So stay tuned for all of that. And with that, I think that we can wrap. Jill and Shelly, did you have anything you wanted to add before we sign off? I just wanted to say, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get to see your faces. Um, for this session, but I did get a chance to scan the name. So um, a special hello to our new families and um, a warm welcome back to our families who were with us last year. I will say that um, faculty has been back now for two days um, and being back on campus has been an an energizing experience for all of us. We've all been working remotely as many of you have been and the opportunity to be safe but be together um, has been a really positive experience for all of us. And um, so I, I wish that experience for your children as well that um, they can come back and be safe but also be part of the, the, the greater uh, Wellington community and for those of you who are learning from home um, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure your children feel like they are a valued active part of that community and we will continue to partner with you throughout this year or however long we are in this circumstance to make sure that we're meeting their needs as well. Thank you so much and um... We will wrap here in a second, but we do have one last question, two last questions actually, that I do think are worth spending a couple of extra minutes on. The first is around teacher safety, and that's something that we are working very hard on behind the scenes, but not something that, you know, we're, we're, we're addressing a lot of students' needs public facing. So can you talk a little bit about how we're teaching or how we're keeping teachers <laughs> safe and um, helping them feel comfortable in the building? Um, well, first of all, making sure that everyone, everybody in the building is wearing a mask and staying distanced, um, making sure we have everything in place we need to um, keep hands clean and sanitized. Um, we're going over all the protocols and training for all the teachers. And I do think having the students come back in their smaller groups will be essential to having time to practice in small groups with children. Um, so that they understand the distancing and we've got markers and we've got dots on the floor and um, sort of, you know, where my bubble is and where your bubble is in a positive way, but a, an important way that we keep the teachers safe as well. Um, you know, it, I think we've all had to decide ourselves whether we feel safe coming back in and every teacher who is coming back um, feels that the protocols that are in place are there to keep them safe as well. And we depend on you as parents to do the screenings at home that you need to do to be extremely careful about not sending a child to school who may not be feeling well. Um, that is an impact on every one of us. And so we are trusting you to do that every single day. Um, and then just how you um, associate outside of school. We're trusting you to be safe outside of school as well because then that keeps all of us safe. So that's how much, how much we trust you and um, that's how much we trust the systems that are in place. 
Thank you so much, Jill. I really appreciate that. Um, the last question I have is really in response to the parameters we're working with in the event that Franklin County or the state of Ohio says we need to move into distance learning. Can you talk a little bit about what that process might look like, what parents can expect? I know we highlighted it in, in version 2.1, but I think it would be good to know what that means for the lower school specifically. Well, I, mean, I, I would urge anyone who hasn't read through that document that you actually read each page of it because it goes into great detail on what the circumstances are that would mean a student stays home, an instructional group stays home, a grade level stays home, a division stays home, or the whole school. So um, I would urge you to go through that first and then see if you have any questions after that. If we would have to, as a school, for whatever reason, um, pivot to learning from home, we will have everything in place because we will have set it up at the beginning of the school year. All of that technology and the training that students will need and that parents will need, we're going to do that first thing um, as the school year is starting. So when we pivot, it won't be like we have to get up and running. We will be up and running. And um, there is the assumption that the teachers would be able to teach from their classrooms even if the students are all virtual so that they would still have access to the new technology and um, all of the resources that they have at school. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jill and Shelley. And thanks to all of our attendees for spending an hour of your evening with us. We will have this recording available in the coming days. And with that, I think we'll wrap. Great. Well, take care, everybody. We miss you. Have a great night, everyone.